in the night and in the morning, we will come to you. Full of sadness, tired and hungry, we will come to you. Lost and puzzled, glad and hopeful, we will come to you. You welcome us and feed us, you question us with love. So good morning everyone and welcome to St Andrew's Methodist Church in Worcester City Centre. However you're joining in this service on this third Sunday of Easter, a time of slowly dawning realisation of the implications that God has raised Jesus from death, that there is new life and hope for each and for all. So we sing a simple, I would call it an Easter carol, now the green blade rises. Let us pray. Lord our God, we praise you for this day. We offer you our worship, our praise and our thanks. We praise you for this wonderful world for all the beauty that surrounds us. We praise you for the love we find in one another and for the peace which comes from knowing you. As we think today of the resurrection of Jesus, we try to gaze into the mystery and to wonder at your love for Jesus and for us and for all the world. We thank you for his presence and for the love and blessing we receive from Jesus by your Holy Spirit here and now. As we worship here this morning, we give thanks for the freedom that we have to meet as Christians. Help us to grasp this opportunity 
and to feed on Jesus in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. On this Sunday, the lectionary, that scheme of readings which many, many churches across the world use to help guide congregations through the Bible over a three-year period, the lectionary brings us today to the stories of two towering figures in the New Testament church. From the resurrection onwards, with Peter, who you can see depicted, I think, on the left, and, and um, Paul, a few dozen years later at the most. There were women among them, the leaders of the church, local leaders, but institutional forces, society, and in their culture, kept them from holding public roles. I've no doubt that women and men experienced the blessings of following Jesus from the very beginning. We're going to hear now a story from John's Gospel, and it will be read to us by Robert in four parts with comments in between each part. And then we shall hear a bit later on in the service, we shall hear very briefly so an important part of the story of Paul. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Peter shows himself the familiar leader, the characteristics that we've seen through the Gospels. Others are following him. They go back to what they know. Even after a resurrection appearance, they go back to what they know. Isn't that so typical of what most people do after a bereavement or a massive great shock in life? We find solace in doing what's familiar, what we know we can do, when everything else in our lives has changed. But for Peter, there was yet more failure. That night, as we heard, that night they caught nothing. So it's a pretty low baseline, the context for what's about to happen. Nothing could be much worse. No pride in even that job well done, and no income for themselves and their families. I'm going to read a reflection by Anne Sardison on this passage. I like things familiar, words, sounds, faces I know. I long for the familiar, somewhere I can stop worrying, somewhere I can get on with doing what I do best. My boat, my beach, my sea, my fish. But now, not even fish. We come when we do not understand. We come when we don't know what to do. We come when all we used to know has disappeared. We come and find you welcoming us 
to a feast and a future. So we hear the Bible story continue. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When, Jesus, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. In this encounter with Jesus, these seven disciples have a lot of interaction. Jesus sees their need from afar and calls out. He gives them a command to shift the nets and they obey, still not knowing it's Jesus, which seems extraordinary in itself. Then there's the chaos of the massively over large haul of fish. And this provokes the moment of recognition. This abundance, giving more than could logically have been anticipated, so characteristic of Jesus in his ministry. It provokes a chaotic response. Imagine jumping in the water fully clothed, the shouting, the dragging this enormous catch onto the land. Their dereliction over the fruitless night is overturned overwhelmingly. So a meditation on this passage. Lord, we remember with gratitude our resurrection appearances, our marriage or a deep relationship had collapsed. A movement we believed in had broken up because of internal feuding. We had unexpectedly lost a job. We went about our daily tasks, but without enthusiasm, just going through the motions. Like Simon Peter saying, I'm going fishing, and the others answering, we'll come with you. Nothing worked. It was a case of going out of the boat and catching nothing all night. Gradually, however, as the weeks went by, a little light appeared. An inner voice told us that it was time to try again. And suddenly things began to come right. With so many fish, we could not haul them in. We know now that the inner voice was your presence within us, a presence that never fails us, even though we don't recognize it at first, like the disciples not realizing it was Jesus standing on the shore. Lord, send us leaders like Jesus, who when people are struggling, do not harangue them, but stand alongside and offer advice so discreetly that the people do not know they are there. But it turns out to be just the right word and the people once more discover their life 
and creative purpose. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. It's a strange thing for me to start thinking about, but in about two months time, it's my leaving service and I was asked to choose the preacher because it's sort of special for me. Um, I wasn't quite sure where to go and who to ask, but eventually I thought of my friend Jonathan. I say friend, but we're not that best buddies. We've gone years without meeting, especially when he lived in the United States. But we trained as ministers together, and I think that forms a special bond. Jonathan and I and another woman, Karen, shared a flat within the college. Way back 24 years ago now, I well remember Jonathan making a comment on this passage as he reported a sermon he'd heard recently, which he said, may the hairs on the back of his head stand on end. The preacher had pointed out that the Greek word for the charcoal fire, which is prominent in this story and is used for cooking the fish, is the same Greek word that is used for the fire in the high priest's courtyard, which is mentioned during Jesus' trial, when the woman accused Peter of being Jesus is friend, and Jesus dramatically denied it. That word for the fire is only used two places in the New Testament. Anyone with a literary ear would instantly have heard the connection. Previously, Peter had reached his lowest point, denying Jesus. Now, here is Peter again, a few weeks later, and another fire. And now Jesus is here, very much alive, in control of the whole group. Peter particularly didn't deserve this generous hospitality, but most of the others probably felt that they could have done things differently and Jesus would not have died. So here is such an unexpected meeting. Stories told very much like the story of Jesus' miracle of the feeding of 5,000 people so unexpectedly. This is what Jesus was like. This is who he was. No wonder that in another completely unexpected setting, they just knew it was Jesus. They didn't need to ask. and a prayer based on this part of the passage. Lord, we thank you for people who have forgiven us. Not a mean or calculating forgiveness, 
not harping on the ways in which we have wronged them, but forgiving with the forgiveness of Jesus, so that it was like coming back from a hard night's work and seeing some bread there and a charcoal fire with fish cooking on it and the very person we had hurt saying, come and have breakfast. And we're not having to ask any questions because we knew that everything was forgiven. Perhaps that experience of forgiveness prompts us to worship as we sing the next song. All heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord. All hand declares the glory of the risen Lord. Who can compare with the beauty of the Lord? Forever he will be, forever he will be, the Lamb on the throne. finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? But he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. This conversation was unavoidable. Peter needed his one-to-one -one conversation with Jesus now, as he'd had them in the past. Commentators on this text could preach 
many sermons. I noticed one that I was just about to throw away from this particular Sunday in 1995. So I've been throwing things away. But commentators would preach on every dis different aspect, closely following whether there's a difference between feed my lambs and feed my sheep. But it really is, it leads to that wholehearted declaration by Peter. He's hurt as it goes along, but then he comes to say, you know that I love you. Then the focus turns back from Peter himself to what Jesus wants him to do. The purpose of this one-to-one -one conversation seems to be to restore Peter to the leadership, the role which he'd held already, and we've seen him during the Gospels, always eager to give, confident enough anyway, to give an answer whether or not it was the right one. The images on the screen this week have mostly been illustrative, just what I could find. But this one is notable because it's very commanding. Perhaps it's a complacent figure holding the keys of the kingdom, which Jesus had already promised to Peter. And some would say the keys to the church as it was to become. Peter's restoration by Jesus was so complete that he was able to go on to be one of the leading figures in the church. And this golden representation perhaps highlights his significance. Now, since we can learn from the way that God deals with all these people in the gospel stories, we can learn from Peter's experience of restoration. We can learn that that can actually take us further than we might have anticipated to more and different and bigger things in life because we are called and equipped for the task. A prayer of thanksgiving. Loving God, we thank you that you care for us. So much that when we go the other way or get things hopelessly wrong, still you come after us, letting us recognize you. We praise you that you go on gently questioning us, as you did Peter, do we love you? Thank you that our partial answers do not make you turn away, but that you still go on, pressing as far as we can bear, no further. Thank you for the opportunity of meeting you wherever we may be, whoever we are. Amen. The next hymn. It was written by Methodist minister Claire Stainsby. It comes from the section of the hymn book about calling and commissioning. This hymn, I think, brings it down to a very straightforward level. As dawn awakes another day.
come now to our prayers for others. Let's pray. Loving God, we come to you in the joy and assurance that the Lord is risen. And we pray for the needs of others, the people known to us and for those known only to you. For you know everything and everyone, and your name is love. We pray for those despairing because of past disappointments, because they seek the forgiveness of others. For those who are uncertain which way to turn next. For people whose work is difficult and unrewarding. We pray that they may meet you in their need. We pray for people despairing about the war in Ukraine and other places of conflict across the world, where senseless destruction is happening, where people are losing their lives and everything about life which they took for granted. We give thanks for humanitarian responses and pray that aid agencies and international organisations will be able to continue their work for peace with justice. We pray that they may meet you in their need. We pray for people standing for election this week across the country, giving thanks that people are prepared to offer leadership and to take responsibility in these changing times. We pray for all who'll be running the elections that they may be kept safe. We pray for all who have opportunity to vote, that they may consider the needs of others and themselves. We pray that those for whom we pray may meet you in their need. This bank holiday weekend, we pray for those who celebrate and delight with family and friends, for parents and grandparents, those newly married or marking an anniversary, Pray for people working in entertainment and the leisure industries. For all who will be reunited after long periods of separation. We pray that they may meet you and share with you. We pray for people who've responded to your call within the leadership of the church. For our circuit ministerial staff in a variety of circumstances at this time. for those who will prepare for and then meet at the Synod here next Saturday.
And we pray for all who are leaders of groups and meetings. We pray that they may minister to others in their need. We pray for all who need to be fed and made comfortable. For those who have grown old and weak or who are sick. For people who go hungry and cannot afford the food they know they need, who cannot pay their bills. Pray for people looking for spiritual food and comfort. We pray that they may meet you and be fed. And we pray quietly for each one of us and the needs that are uppermost on our hearts, things that preoccupy our minds, the people whom we love. Gracious God, as the disciples were delighted at the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained to serve you with our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We followed closely one of the stories about Jesus' appearance featuring the man who was to become that towering leader, Peter. But the church is also encouraged today, I made this up, to read the story of Saul's conversion. There are several slightly different accounts as you would expect if you wrote about something significant that happened to you. You write it on different occasions and you'd write it to different people. You would say slightly different things, but we're going to hear one of those accounts. As we've heard, Jesus forgave and restored and commissioned the people that he had already called to follow him in his ministry. Now we hear about a rapid U-turn from a sworn enemy. And this person also became a significant leader of the church. Saul soon became Paul. We shall hear of a road to Damascus experience that's become a figure of speech for any rapid revelation, and sometimes that U-turn. There's another way 
of meeting with Jesus, another way of becoming his follower. Completely different from Peter's encounters. Neither can be understood without the other. Because God's purposes are so broad that there's no one way to come to faith which can be described and no way, certainly, that should be prescribed. So God's absolutely unexpected revelation. Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Peter never met Jesus before his crucifixion. Sorry, Paul never met Jesus before his crucifixion, but he certainly regarded himself as an eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection because of that encounter that we've just heard read. And dramatic things like that still happen, praise God. Christ is alive today. So we come to our last hymn, Christ is Alive. Let Christians sing. in your hands we know that we love you wrap our lives in your life we know that we trust you call our names in friendship we know that we will follow you risen Jesus send us out in justice and joy and we bless one another May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.